Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday Monday Mindset Mindset Podcast. Podcast. Where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 20. This week it's Terry's turn to share something she's found interesting with us. What have you got for us this week, Terry? Well, Daisy, I listened to a podcast this week that I hadn't listened to in quite some time. I used to listen to it fairly frequently. It's called On Being with Krista Tippett, and some listeners may be familiar with it. One of the things that I always find, the conversations are usually quite deep and insightful, but also the way she speaks is so calming and soothing that it feels a little bit like that Saturday Night Live skit where they were doing an NPR, a play on an NPR interview. But anyway, Krista Tippett is amazing and her guests are amazing as well. In this episode, she actually talks with someone she knows well, a neighbor of hers or friend from her hometown. And you can tell that they're quite close. But the topic is really interesting. And Hard to describe the structure of it, but basically when she records an episode, they just have a very long conversation that is unscripted, unedited, and she actually publishes that. And then after that, she publishes the edited version. So this episode was a replay from a conversation they had in 2016, and it came out this summer. So I believe it was July of this summer. And then to follow up, they did a recap of this conversation specific to our current times. So the episode originally was episode 856 and 857, so the unedited and then the edited versions. And it was with Pauline Boss, and the title of it was called Navigating Loss Without Closure. And then the last episode, 858, was Living the Questions, So Krista Tippett comes back with some questions to go over with the guest. And this was called Living the Questions. It's really settling in now, the losses, large and small. So Pauline Boss, the guest, she's a psychologist and emeritus professor at the University of Minnesota. And she coined the term in psychology of ambiguous loss. And it comes out of her study of missing persons, people dealing with these situations where family members were missing after an earthquake or a natural disaster, prisoner of war, refugees, but then also going for other things such as moving away from home, leaving your homeland, and now even the pandemic. So I think this is a really important topic because oftentimes we think of loss, we think of grief as being kind of finite. Mm. So ambiguous loss defies resolution, creates long-term confusion about who is in or out of a particular couple or family, and freezes the process of grieving. With death, there is official certification of loss, proof of the transformation from life to death, and support for mourners through community rituals and gatherings. But with ambiguous loss, none of these markers exist. The persisting ambiguity blocks cognition, coping, meaning-making, and freezes the grief process. Mm. Yeah, that not knowing. Yeah. And so in their initial conversation, I listened to the full long conversation, tons of talk about this ambiguous loss. And the idea that, again, relationships are broken for various reasons, divorce, but co-parenting. So the person is still present, but not. Mm -hmm. Or even some of the study came out of when a parent might be fairly absent because of their work or another reason. So there's this holding of two things. There's presence and absence. And how do we deal with that? psychological absence or presence, and physical absence or presence. So it was really a fascinating Mm. conversation that the two of them had about this. Oftentimes when we talk about grief and loss, you'll hear people talk about coming to closure. 
And this, again, the title of this was Navigating Loss Without Closure. And that that's really a term that we want to apply to loss. We want things to be tidied up with a bow at the end. And her point is that the word closure works really well in a finite situation like a real estate deal. There is closure. You go to a closing of your home. But in human relationships, we really don't have closure. Once someone is a part of you, in some ways they are always a part of you, even if they're physically absent through death, divorce, moving, whatever that is. So it really brought up ideas for me about grief, not just around death, but again, this more ambiguous loss. So one of the ways we often work through our grieving process is to make meaning of things. And we mentioned this a little bit last week in our episode. One of the ways that this is challenging with ambiguous loss is, again, a quote from Viktor Frankl, something to the effect of, there is no meaning without hope, and there is no hope without meaning, or vice versa. I can't remember how he said that. But that we need something to kind of latch on to, to make meaning of and rebuild hope, and we need hope to make meaning. So I think this is a really important concept. Now, a lot of us are familiar, we've heard reference to the stages of grief Mm. from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who was a psychiatrist who came up with a model that has been widely used. Unfortunately, this model has been kind of misused or misinterpreted. The way she actually created the model was in reference to people who are dying and the stages of grieving that they go through. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Not the people on the other side who are experiencing the loss of that person. Ah, So I think oftentimes when we think of grief, we check in, where am I in these stages? What stage am I in? The other challenge with the stage model is oftentimes people assume they're linear, Mm. that we go from one stage to the next. Yeah. So once you're on stage three, you're completely done with two and one. (laughs) Right. And that that somehow gives us a frame of reference that helps us know progress. Mm. We want to know when will this Mm. grieving be done for ourselves and for other people. We want to know where is someone in this process? Why aren't they on stage four yet? Oh, good. They're on stage five. This will be done soon. And so we put a lot of emphasis, I think, on the timing of grief and that there is a specific process to go through and a time related to that. And she had tons of interesting conversation about that related to In the U.S., her discussion was, you know, we are a country based on a lot of ambiguous loss, a country that was started by people who came here from other places and left people behind and left home based on slavery, based on so many problematic things, civil war, so that we have this underlying ambiguous loss. And it makes us uncomfortable. And so we want a finite process to understand loss. So again, the first two episodes that I listened to were very interesting. But then the third one was about specifically right now and what's going on. It was recorded or it was aired in July. We are in October at this point. But her theory of ambiguous loss has been being quoted by a lot of people right now. So she's kind of excited that her term has really taken hold and people understand it. But it was never a way that she thought it would end up being used in this global pandemic. Obviously, there's a lot of death happening during the virus. People losing family members, loved ones, neighbors, people losing homes, people losing careers, People losing a sense of security about where their career was headed or what the future was going to look like, maybe about their financial savings, all kind of ways that things look completely different now. Young people who didn't get to graduate in the way that we normally graduate, Mm. weddings that can't be celebrated the way we normally celebrate weddings, funeral services that can't be had as we normally would. So there's a lot of this ambiguous loss happening all around us. And a lot of these things that we think of typically 
not exactly as closure, but like a passing from one state to another or mm -hmm. some kind of closure mm -hmm. in some way. I mean, obviously things like funerals are a typical example, but you mm -hmm. just mentioned things like graduation. You know, that's a, that's a closure, isn't it? Absolutely. Finishing one part of education, moving on to the next. Absolutely. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment because she does talk some about that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about for everyone right now, even if you are not experiencing a death of someone related to the virus or a loss of your home, in the U.S., we have recently been going through very difficult times with fires creating quite a bit of destruction, loss, death, uh, racial tensions causing tons of loss, lives, connections, resources. But I want people to think a little bit about symptoms of grief, because I think right now, people may not be identifying that some of the challenge they're facing is that they're actually grieving. And so some symptoms of grief may typically present are crying, headaches, difficulty sleeping, questioning the purpose of life, questioning spiritual beliefs, feeling of detachment, isolation from friends and family, abnormal behavior, worry, anxiety, frustration, guilt, fatigue, anger, loss of appetite, aches and pains, and stress. So what I wanted to encourage is for everyone to kind of put into context when they're experiencing these things right now to recognize these are signs of grief especially in the context of this ambiguous loss. Sometimes it may not be easy to know what it is I'm grieving. Because again, there's ambiguity about it. We don't know what's coming. We don't know what's happening with our careers or school or whatever it might be. And again, things that we may not recognize as reasons to be grieving because they're not things we are used to. They're not only divorce or death, but as you just said, not getting to have a funeral the way we normally would. So I wanted to share some ideas that she had about how to manage these things, both for ourselves and in working with other people. I think first of all, recognizing our ambiguous loss and our grieving process around that, to show compassion to ourselves to understand part of grieving is to feel sad. And unfortunately, in certain circles and maybe even in the field of psychology, this can sometimes get pathologized mm. that you need medication or therapy when in actuality you're sad. There's nothing pathological about that. And generally what we need when we're sad due to loss is we need connection. We need community we need the meaning making that I mentioned earlier, and we need rituals. So keeping rituals as well as we can at this point. I think recently you attended some type of a service to celebrate someone's life. Mm. Weddings, graduations, proms, things that are rituals of connection around losses and even celebrations but to keep these rituals when possible, even though they may look different, though they may be over Zoom or socially distant, to, again, stay connected with people. You and I have stayed connected over Zoom. Keeping our connection with people going is really important in helping us to work through our grief and feel supported. Yeah, and ultimately, we're adaptive, aren't we? Our bodies are very good and our minds to a certain extent are good at adapting to new environments. Mm -hmm. It might take a while and it might be painful, it might be uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. we do adapt to new ways of communicating, for example. And that brings up another point of allowing new meaning making. Mm. We are all experiencing things differently than we have before and are having to make new meaning of how life works. And rather than only seeing this as the loss, which there are many losses involved, there are also new opportunities and new ways of making sense of things. And she talked about the idea of learning to live with the change 
And the idea that acceptance really is a choice. It's not something that's forced on us. Sometimes people say, well, I just have to accept it. Mm. Well, that doesn't usually feel positive versus I'm choosing to accept this and incorporate it. So kind of taking things on our own term. Because again, right now, there's so much that we don't control that learning how to take in the parts that we do control making meaning, keeping rituals, all of those things are parts that we actually can control. And then also how to help others dealing with ambiguous loss. And again, this can be during the pandemic, but even when someone has a loved one who is missing because of, let's say, for example, in the US, while places were being evacuated due to fires, Rather than to say to someone, oh, it's okay, don't worry, they'll be fine, or you know he's going to be okay, to acknowledge where they are. And so again, thinking about our own possible discomfort with loss and grief, sometimes we have a hard time just sitting with other people's difficult place with it. So asking genuinely of them and then giving time allowance, not expecting them to be at a certain point at a certain time. A lot of Pauline's work also stems from processing things, for example, after 9-11 and number of missing people afterward while they were searching and helping families work through this time, not expecting them to be over it next year Mm. or three years later or four years later. Another way to help other people is to express compassion and to work on not pathologizing their process, acknowledging that they're being sad. That's a normal part of grieving. That's not them doing something abnormal in this situation. And again, not expecting a timeline is really important. Giving people the space. Grief looks different for all of us. You know, you could be sad about something 15 years later, and that doesn't mean you didn't grieve it properly or you aren't done, that you didn't get closure. Again, those aren't really terms that work with grief. That's the really difficult thing about being in that kind of place mentally, isn't it? Being in grief, being in a really bad period of depression, say, which is generally probably much shorter lived but it's what you were saying before about needing it to be linear needing to know when it's going to be finished Mm -hmm. needing to know where you are in the process okay i know where i am i'm at now it's going to be x number of days x number of weeks x number of years and then it will be done Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it just doesn't work like that Mm mm-hmm I thought it was fascinating what you were saying about the stages of grief. I absolutely thought that was about grieving for somebody else that died. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was the person themselves Mm -hmm. who was dying. How interesting. Mm -hmm. So completely misused by most people then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And certainly there's some applicability of those concepts. Mm. But again, I think it's something that as humans, we often want, we want an explanation for a process so that we can quantify it and know what to expect when, know that we're being successful at it. And so again, we like these stage models of kind of giving us a concept of knowing where we are. And of course, is that why it worked more? That's why it fitted more because there was a finite end to it. There were the stages. Absolutely. It was going to have a predictable end. Absolutely. Mm. And they were not going to experience ongoing loss mm. and grief after. <laughs> no. Absolutely. Even Pauline Boss, the psychologist being interviewed, she is currently caretaking of her husband. And so rather limited in some of the things she can do during the pandemic And she talks about the importance of some of the generous things people are doing, like leaving fresh vegetables on her doorstep because she can't go to the farmer's market. And then she was talking about even self-compassionate things she does, that there may be days where she says, you know, I just want to watch Netflix today. 
And rather than pathologize that as being unmotivated or something she shouldn't be doing, to let herself say, it's okay, watch some Netflix today. I hear this a lot in my work currently and watching it with so many people. I think it's hard for us sometimes to really put into context most of us are experiencing different layers of grief right now. And it's an uncomfortable place to be. And it's not just some of us, which is also a little different. Oftentimes when there's a tragedy or Mm. a death or a divorce, it's one or a few people experiencing the loss and others around them who are not experiencing the loss. Versus in this situation, we're all in a similar place of varying degrees of loss, which is a little unknown to most of us. Yes, like you say, everyone is. I mean, it is a, it's a global feeling, obviously, mm-hmm. very varying degrees, but everyone on the planet is in it mm-hmm. to a degree. And so again, kind of keeping in mind the proactive things or ways to shape it positively for us as we're navigating this, staying connected as we can, keeping rituals, continue to make meaning. And my hope is when I say that it's pretty clear, I don't mean make negative meaning Mm. because we can use that in a very destructive way. We can, you know, go down the rabbit hole of this is just horrible. This is, you know, doom and gloom and pending doom for all of us versus there are new things coming out of this. We are going to be finding new ways of navigating our futures that we haven't even been able to imagine yet. And so continuing with positive meaning making and acceptance of our new meanings and our new lives. Yes, that's right. I'm thinking back to the creation, maintenance, Mm -hmm. destructive episode Mm -hmm. and remembering that always when you're in that period of destruction, remembering what comes next Mm -hmm. and the creation that comes out of it. The other thing that I've always talked about with grief, and she mentioned it in one of these episodes and I think is really important context as well is that experiencing grief, experiencing loss, reminds us of other losses in our lives. And these can be from years ago. They can even be intergenerational. So she was from an immigrant family, and though she did not move from another country to the U.S., her parents did, and her grandparents, and she watched that play out, the losses that they experienced. So even though they weren't her losses, she experienced them. And we see this with so many things in our world today, the generational effects of grief and loss. So the idea that recognizing sometimes our grief and loss responses are not just tied to today, They are also tapping into past grief for us. And so just giving ourselves the room to acknowledge that and not minimizing or maybe not giving ourselves permission to fully engage the grief that we're feeling. Yes, I think it's a good thing for people to remember, maybe a bit of an an aha moment, really. You know, I hear, I see a lot of posts in my Facebook group with women talking about and often beating themselves up a bit with falling off the keto wagon or, you know, feeling super stressed, things very stressed in their household, stress with work, stress with people being ill, people dying, you know, whatever it is. And and quite often that turns in on themselves with diet, with some kind of substance use, whatever it is. And I think if you reframe that (laughs) in, hey, look, you're grieving, Mm -hmm. I think more people might just give themselves a pass. Mm -hmm. And just when you look at it that way, just be a little bit kinder to yourself. Absolutely. So Daisy, of course, as we always kind of get to this place of summing up, I hope that there are things that people can take from today's episode They may want to go back and listen to these conversations that I've shared, 
Of course, she has written a book called Ambiguous Loss, so may be interested in reading that. But I hope people can take just a few things from today and use them in their immediate circumstances. Definitely. Yeah, it's definitely been a bit of an awareness for me. I certainly hadn't thought of it that way. I hadn't looked through that lens of grief other than in examples that I've seen in my own life. Like you mentioned, a friend of mine died. And so watching, you know, my friend go through an, an extreme period of grief. And that's what I typically think of as grief. So I, I, yes, I hadn't thought of applying this larger lens mm -hmm. globally to uh, being what, what everyone's going through in some degree or another. So yes, I think, I think probably that just makes me, I guess, consider how you would treat somebody who was grieving. So again, to maybe just be a little bit more patient, mm -hmm. a little bit more kind, a little bit more thoughtful mm -hmm. with everybody and my interactions, especially online. Nice. And I think my takeaway from this is going back to the word closure and not expecting myself or others to come to a neatly wrapped up place of closure with things. My mom died about a year and a half ago and not having an expectation of myself that that's closed and done, but that the grieving process goes on and some days the sadness will come up and other days I'll be in a good place with it. Mm. But not holding myself to some sense of closure is necessary because as she said, once people are in our lives, they don't go away completely, even if they're physically not present. Mm. Well, something we can find absolute closure to is the end of this episode. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's an example of closure being an important concept to apply. This episode will end. <laughs> Our connection won't end, but the episode will. So I hope everyone has a great week. And thank you for this discussion today, Daisy. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.